impact are increasingly expected from funding agencies, regardless which academic discipline we are talking about. Science communication has become ever more important and an ever more important skill scholars and scientists are expected to engage in and develop and to receive training for. What about linguistics in this respect, the scientific study of language? And what about communicating with the public about language, the English language in particular, from a linguistic point of view? This is what we want to learn about and discuss in the course of the next 80 minutes or so. And I'm extremely glad to have two experts with us who know much more about this than most of us. And I say good afternoon, Kate, and good morning, Dan. Thank you, Bert. Morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being part of this event. Um, and you see, uh, we have um, already raised an interest of about 20 people, and this is this is fantastic. Let me briefly introduce our two experts. Um, what has always astonished me most about Kate is the wonderful way she has gone as an academic from writing a PhD on syntactic change in medieval Dutch to doing the kinds of things that she's doing today and that she's known best for. So um, after that first book, uh, she has um, published uh, another 25 or so, and she has written many, many articles. Um, and she has also always found very nice titles for her books. I mean, uh, some of the nice titles for an introduction of linguistics, for instance, is For the Love of Language. I mean, who wouldn't want to be introduced to linguistics in a, by a book like this? Or a, an older book, Gift of the Garb, Morsels of English Language History, or as someone who likes to study taboo words also, forbidden words, taboo and the censoring of language. Um, she is here, however, primarily because she is really also um, in Australia, uh, a longtime media presence um, on the radio, on TV, as the language expert, as the language consultant. And she has collected many, many experiences, positive and negative, that I, I guess she will share with us um, over all these years. Um, I remember in 2017, 18, Kate came to Freiburg. Um, for a for a fellowship at our Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies. And um, her research project then was something I think that she has worked on uh, also for a much longer time, from obelisks and asterisks to modern day views about the English usage. And what she's interested and was interested then very much was popular perceptions of language and also the ordinary people as language guardians and language um, language criticizers, uh, 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 critics, uh, for example. Um, and um, she really wants to, to, to wanted to investigate um, what the ordinary people have to say about language and to what extent we have ordinary censorship in the in the population. Okay, that's that's um, Kate. Um, Dan um, works at the University of Uppsala, where she where he actually moved to um, about a year ago. You said uh, Dan. Formerly he was uh, at the University of Huddersfield, and he's a person of the north in general. I would think, at least ac academically, because he he did all his degrees at my favorite university, U Lancaster University. So bachelor, master, PhD uh, at at Lancaster. Um, and uh, he also has experience as a um, as um, English as a foreign language teacher before he did his PhD. So he also has this sort of pedagogical element in his in his CV. And he is with us here because he has really published a lot in this field of um, yeah communicating lang language and linguistics to the public. Uh, only very recently uh, he published the Babel lexicon of language. Uh, he also um, um, co-edited um, a book that came out uh, this year, Communicating Linguistics, Language, Community, and Public Engagement, a book that he um, co-edited with Hazel Price. And I should mention that he is the co-founder and co-editor of Babel, the language magazine. And I think um, he will tell us more about this also um, in the course of the next um, hour or so. Let me open with two questions to each one of you. Um, and then I will give each one of you the floor 
so that you have five to 10 minutes to say something at a stretch about your experiences with communicating language and linguistics to the public. And to the audience, I can say that I will always uh, keep an eye on the watch after roughly half an hour. So once the two presentations are done, I will just see where we stand time-wise. And either I ask some questions or even better, I see raised hands. Um, and um, so you can come in immediately with your questions. So because we want to make this as interactive an event as possible. So um, my two opening questions to... Kate, um, uh, relatively simple. Um, is it actually difficult to interest the public in language issues? So do do you is it do we have to make an effort? Did you have to make an effort? And the second question is, um, to some extent, of course, that the, the 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 title of this event is a misnomer: communicating linguistics to the public. I mean, none of us is, I guess, trying to communicate linguistics to the public. We want to communicate about language and we want to raise language awareness, but we don't want to give an introductory lecture necessarily introducing, you know, terminology. So, um, but nevertheless, what is your experience, um, um, Kate, and maybe Dan wants to comment on this as well, if you um, talk to the public as a representative of that profession? So what is the public image of linguists according to your experience? All right, these maybe have been, may have been two, more than two questions, but Kate, you can correct, you can correct <laughs> all of them. <laughs> good, good questions, Bernd. Thank you. But perhaps if I, I've got just these three slides which I've put together, and I, I think I, uh, in addressing what I've, the points I've got on those slides, I think it will cover those two questions, I hope. We'll see. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah. So if I share the screen now, sorry, bear with me. I'm such a dill when it comes to these things. Um, share. Okay, here we go. So, right. Ah, uh, from the start. Here we go. Um, can you all see that? Okay. Yep. So I I started with this slide because um. I thought and this goes to you know what we call this endeavor. Uh, you'd be interested in the name that, in fact, was the brainchild of um, Lauren Gorn from La Trobe University, and also the internet linguist Gretchen McCulloch. Uh, so Lingcom is what they refer to this as, and those that do it are Lingcomers. So the the uh, conference that they ran in two thousand twenty one uh, was a way of trying to get everyone involved in this endeavor. So I think it. Um, it was a, a terrific conference, and I think they are planning another one. I'm not sure when, though. Uh, so, but I thought, you know, to set the scene, perhaps I'd just mention a couple of things that I suppose opened my eyes to uh, the importance of this kind of engagement, if I put it this way. It goes by a number of different names, doesn't it? Knowledge transfer, community engagement, even, you know, terrible acronyms. But um, anyway, the... the Things that really alerted me, well, a number of things did. When I finished my, my doctorate in Middle Dutch syntax and I came back to Melbourne, uh, uh, well, I'll confine myself to two things. Uh, my first ever linguistics conference from the Australian Linguistic Society, I've just, as I say, come back to Melbourne, and uh, one paper sticks in my mind, it will never leave me, and that was one by um, Diana Eads, a sociolinguist, and she's also a specialist in um, language and the legal process. And she talked about um, the case of Kelvin Condren, an Aboriginal man who was jailed for life for a murder he didn't commit. And uh, he always maintained his innocence, claimed he was verbaled, as they put it, by the police. And she showed very cleverly that indeed that was the case, that there were structures in that so-called confession that were not in his Aboriginal English. This was a man from far north Queensland in the north of Australia. Uh, but the judges uh, did not admit the linguistic evidence. The Judges, which I found astonishing, never got this idea that someone from far north Queensland could speak the variety of English that I'm speaking now, but, you know, a, a different variety that would not have, you know, would have certain structures that, you know, are not in my English. Or, uh, and it sort of seems like basic linguistics 101 to us. 
but those judges just didn't get it. Condren was jailed for life, of a, as I said. Uh, he was let out seven years later when they actually found the person that did the murder. So that that has, you know, it, it was astonishing to me that just what we take as kind of basic linguistic knowledge just was not known. Uh, the problem is, I think, that we are dealing with the kind of everyday. Everyone speaks language, and so it's... Um, Sometimes it's very hard to get linguistic evidence admitted as legal, you know, as, as real evidence. And I've had lawyers that have confirmed that with me because obviously language is something that everyone can master and including clever judges. So yeah, it, it was um, yeah, a case that just sticks with me. And the other, the other thing that happened, and I'm sorry, Bount and, and Dan, because I already mentioned this to you, around that same time, I switched on the radio Listen to my favourite science program, The Science Show, which is all around Australia. And astonishingly, this program was on infixes. Oh, gosh, you know, this is interesting. Um, and it was by a Monash academic who was a physicist whose hobby was language. Uh, now, you know, I might be wrong, but I don't think even a deep love of quantum mechanics or astrophysics would guarantee me a gig on The Science Show but somehow they felt it was all right for him to do this show. And needless to say, there wasn't a single infix in the entire program. So I was outraged, as was David Wilkins at the time, and we both were both sort of, you know, fledgling tutors in the linguistics program at La Trobe. So we wrote very bravely to the, to the science show host, Robin Williams, and complained. He wrote back to us, he apologised, and he said, uh, you know, suggested we do something about this and offer something on language. And to my shame, we never did. We just were a bit overwhelmed by that. And that's my, my regret to this day that we never did anything about this. So a couple of years later, I got the opportunity to fill in, in fact, for a, on a radio show that had just started this sort of language talkback segment. This was the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I took it on, I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. In fact, so terrified that I, I wised up my, my mate, Judy, to phone in occasionally and ask questions that I knew something I could actually be guaranteed to be able to answer. Uh, so it was always a relief to see Jude of North Fitzroy or Judith of North Carlton up on the screen there. I knew I could answer at least one question. That, that was a long time ago. Anyway, let me just say a little something about what I'm doing at the moment. Um, I've got a here we go here. So I, most of the work I do is in fact radio, uh, and I've got um, you know apart from one off topic that uh, I mean I usually get about one or two of those a week hot linguistic topics. There's always something in the newspaper about language. Uh, most recently, it was astonishingly that uh, Australian English was judged among the most attractive accents in the world by some survey that was done in the States. Now, that was hot news to most Australians. So there was a lot of, uh, lot of exciting talk back on that. But um, so I've got these seven programs, um, most of them with the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, a national broadcaster. Uh, some of them are local ABC, some of them are Australia around Australia. Most of them are fortnightly. And there are also a couple of um, uh, commercial radio stations there as well. Uh, I've also done a bit of podcasting and the only series I've been involved in is this Inside Story, which is an ongoing language podcast series with Peter Clark, who was also an ABC presenter. Uh, I put the television um, program, Can We Help, up there. Uh, I, I do a bit of um, you know, one-off television things, but this was a six-year um, program, and I included this even though it's no longer running because it does go to, in fact, something that you asked for your first question, I think, Bount, uh, which is, you know, people's love of language. Because they started this show, it was called Can We Help? So people sent in questions on anything, and they were getting so many questions on language that they felt they had to put a special language segment on. Now, the time that I got involved, um, I was doing, I, I was receiving something like 30 to 40 questions a week on language, huge numbers of questions coming in. Uh, so yes, people are, it's my experience that people are just simply fascinated by language. They are fascinated by that thing that, you know, makes them tick and they want to know more about it. Uh, so I think we're very lucky in that, in that respect. Uh, 
There are also these sort of newspaper magazines, blogs, and I'm sure a lot of people are involved in this sort of work, but I just wanted to um, alert you to something I think I've, I've mentioned to you, Bernd, when, when I was in, in Frias, which is the conversation, and some of you probably already contribute to the conversation, but it is this, um, it's an example of what is it called, um, oh, explanatory journalism, I think, where academics will post um, directly to the reading audience. Uh, it was actually something, an initiative that started in Melbourne in 2011, and since then it's got outlets, as you can see, in Africa, Brazil, uh, Brazil most recently, that was just launched in September, in fact, uh, uh, and that's in Portuguese, which is the fifth language uh, for them, and France, Canada, Indonesia, Spain, UK, US, and they've got a reach of, you know, over... 40 million people, and that's through Creative Commons replication or republication. So that's uh, that was, I think, as of 2020. So uh, something I did recently with my colleague Howie Manns on Australian slang, I think we got 155,000 readers. So a lot more readers than I'll ever get on anything on Middle Dutch, that's for sure. Um, um, then uh, just, just one other um, sort of opportunities that you might not have thought about, and that's... Uh, these are dinner, lunchtime talks for conferences and workshops, not part of linguistics. Uh, so they can be the usual suspects like editors or teachers. I, I do a fair bit of that, but there are also ones you might not have thought about beyond the usual suspects. So they might be insurance companies or, I don't know, legal firms, you know, doctors and perioperative nurses. You, and you might think, what on earth would I say to something, someone like, I don't know, a bunch of insurers or, but if you think about it, because language underpins everything, there's always something we can say to these groups. And it, and it can be a, a very important opportunity to actually get information about language out there. So in the case of, I don't know, the, the insurers, you can uh, point out to them that despite the sort of plain English movement, or maybe it's the plain Norwegian movement or the plain Swedish movement, that people's, you know, insurance documents still lurk unread in, in the bottom drawer of people's, you know, sort of bedside tables. or And they're still very, very difficult things to read despite the plain language. Uh, so it is an opportunity, of course, to talk about jargon. And there are all sorts of interesting aspects of language that you can cover in these sorts of talks. Uh, and then there are high schools, and I'm not going to talk too much about that because I know that, that Bernd um, has a, something in pl planned for high schools, but certainly I can emphasise that here in Australia, humanities is under threat like it never before. Uh, and there are, you know, humanities areas closing down left, right and centre in universities. So the future of humanities lies in those high school students, and I really think we need to engage more with them. Uh, so I often will go out and do high school talks. In fact, there is a, a speakers list that's been set up by Boo Book Education, so linguists have a chance to um, uh, put their sort of profiles up there and also what they're happy to talk about in schools and they can get engagements through that um, uh, through that website. And just one other thing uh, I'll mention because I can't help it because it's only just appeared. These are some, a couple of high school textbooks that I've just finished with colleagues of mine, Debbie DeLapse and Elizabeth Burke, um, Isabel Burke, sorry. Uh, it's only just appeared, so I'm very, very excited. But this is English linguistics for year 11 and year 12. This is actually the fourth edition, but it was a major rewrite. Uh, so we are lucky here in Victoria to have English linguistics in the high school. So that gives us another opportunity to, to engage with, with um, kids in schools. Uh, but, you know, I should finish because I've probably prattled on way too long. Um, can I just say that, you know, this public engagement is very much a, a two-way street. Um, you know, I, I, um, it, it does take a lot of time, but it is immensely rewarding. And I learn a huge amount from the public and they inform my teaching and my research in ways that I could never have thought of. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with just probably what is still my favourite question from the public, one of my favourite, there have been a lot, but I always get the, the best questions from little kids. And so, you know, what's, what's not to love about Isaac aged five years old? You know, and as he says, I'm learning to read. Obviously, this is through his parents he posted this question. And I think there's something a bit funny about the English language. It certainly is. Uh, 
can you tell me why words like is and as are spelt with an S and not a Z like they sound? And also why the word of is spelt with an F and not the V that it sounds like? I'm also having trouble with silent K, etc. So here's the opportunity. And this is the fun bit. And this is the challenge as well. You know, how to talk about, I don't know, voicing and consonants and uh, the weakening of grammatical words, you know, to an audience that will probably know more about stem cell research than they do about consonants and vowels and nouns and verbs. So, and to do it all in, I was given 60 seconds to answer questions like this, and you had to get it within 60 seconds or they would edit you uh, in ways that you may not like. So, you know, it, it was um, yeah, immensely satisfying and a lot of fun. But look, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, as I said, I, don't, I answered your question, Bert, I don't know. Well, um, this, this is where I wanted to take up uh, my, my, my two questions again. So I think we have clearly understood that no one needs to convince anyone to develop an interest in language because people have an interest in uh, an intrinsic language, uh, interest in language. Um, and from what you said about um, going out to the bankers, to the insurers, to all sorts of communities to talk about various aspects of language, I would translate into the assumption that they seem to have a, a positive image of what a linguist can tell them. I mean, uh, you have, so you have not encountered resistance that here is the expert who wants to tell us how to speak. We're in a bit of a tricky position because uh, I also remember that dreadful description of linguistics and linguists in the newspaper about also the same time as I came out to Australia, describing linguistics as the pointy headed abstruse strudel of academic linguistics. And the sad aspect of that article about linguistics was that if you want to know something about language, don't ask a linguist. Uh, the, the point was that we were trying to shield people from knowing anything useful. So on the one hand, you've got the, the pointy headed abstruse strudel of academic linguistics. On the other hand, you've got that aspect that I mentioned that, you know, we are seen as doing something so every day as language that really anyone can do it, particularly lawyers and judges, of course, and, and educators, that it really doesn't involve any expertise. So it's very, it's a, it's a kind of fine line, really, you've got to kind of somehow assert your expertise, but not in a way that's going to get up people's noses, particularly in Australia, <laughs> where there's this general distrust, as I think there is worldwide now about experts, you know, knowing stuff isn't enough, as one memorable headline put it. No, knowing stuff may also be not to be not to not to to welcome actually. <laughs> you know, so no, that's, that's right. 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 <laughs> We've seen plenty of evidence of that. <laughs> okay, let's 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 move on to to Dan. And um, I mean, you're also welcome to address the things that I asked Kate. But uh, the the two specific questions I would have to you is, on the one hand, um, according to experiences, is there anything special in interacting with the public compared with, for example, I don't know, first year students or so? Um, do we have to um, think of certain things that we should then also um, make influence the way in which we try to get across certain, certain things about um, language? And secondly, what are some uh, what are the, some typical misconceptions and myths um, about language on the one hand and linguistics on the other hand that you came across and that one very often and repeatedly needs to address just to get them out of the way before maybe you can say the things that you wanted to to actually say. So Dan, what's your take on this? And, and, and you have also many things to tell us, I'm sure, about your magazine, for example, and your recent publications. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, those are interesting questions. And I, I think to some degree, at least in my experience, linguistics um, is a misunderstood discipline. Um, and I think there is sometimes a view that linguists believe that anything goes um, uh, and that there is no right or wrong in language. Whereas the public perception of language is that there is a right and a wrong way of using it. Um, and often what linguists are trying to do is, like Kate said, tread that fine line um, between conveying your expert knowledge uh, and also um, understanding that the public also has a view uh, about language. Um, so there is, I think, sometimes a very prescriptivist approach to language that you encounter when you're trying to talk about linguistics uh, to the public. Um, and so that, that can be quite a, quite a tricky thing to deal with it, I think. Um, 
I'll per perhaps come on to, to more of that when I, I show a few slides. Um, your, your other question, I think, was about uh, how you talk to the public about linguistics and is it different from uh, talking to, uh, say, first year undergraduate students? Um, I think in, in my experience, again, not really, um, because the good thing, the advantage about talking to the to the public about linguistics is, again, like Kate said, you have a ready made audience. People are always interested in language because everybody or most people have uh, a language uh, capability and are interested uh, in language. They might be coming at language from a prescriptivist viewpoint, but at least you've got something that you can you can start from that you can work with. You have a sort of um, inbuilt uh, enthusiasm there which I think is you know, a really useful thing um, if, if you want to, to communicate about your, your discipline. Um, so that, that's, that's what I would say in response to those two questions particularly. Um, I'll, share, I'll share my screen now and uh, I'll show a few slides. Um, so Ben, you mentioned that um, I published a book earlier this year with a, my colleague Hazel Price, uh, which was called Communicating Linguistics. And I thought that given the topic of the uh, of the forum, um, I would start by talking about some of the ideas um, in, the, in the introductory chapter uh, to that book. The reason we put that book together was really just to try and uh, think about how you go about doing um, public linguistics from a, from a theoretical uh, standpoint. Uh, and also to try and showcase lots of the different ways in which uh, linguists are talking about linguistics to the to the wider community. Um, so really, we're we're talking about methods of of public engagement, and I think the interesting thing about linguistics is um, when you look at its history as a discipline, it's always had a, a public engagement element to it. Um, and as we started to think about the history of linguistics and, and how it's emerged as a discipline, um, it became clear that there has always been this, this element to it, this, this sort of communicative uh, element. And so what we started to try and do was to try and uh, categorize the different ways in which linguists have, have engaged with the, the public. And um, if you go right back um, to the beginnings of, of linguistics as a discipline. This is actually pre-modern linguistics. Um, if you think about the work of Franz Boas, for example, one of the earliest uh, field linguists, Boas did a lot of work on language documentation with the, the Inuit of Baffin Island, for example, um, and the indigenous people of, of Vancouver Island. Um, and Boas's work was hugely influential and, and had a, a big impact on our concept of cultural relativism, you know, the idea that one there is no one culture that is any better or, or any worse that, than another. So very important work based on the, the linguistic documentation work that, that he did. But when you look at the work that he did from, uh, from a, a contemporary standpoint, it looks rather acquisitional, that, that's how we, we put it, that Boaz's approach was to, to say, well, here is uh, an indigenous community that has something that will be useful to me in my work. Um, and rather than really engaging with them in the way that, that modern field linguists would do, um, I think he, Boaz and the field linguists like him saw, him saw these people rather more as a source of information uh, for them as linguists. And there was very little sort of reciprocity um, uh, about that. But interesting, that, it, that that degree of public engagement was going on right back then. Um, then in trying to identify other kinds of uh, public engagement, um, we thought that we, we'd identified something which we, we, came, uh, we came up with the title contributory public engagement for. And this um, I would explain as the kind of thing that um, you see when the Oxford English Dictionary was first started. An idea really that um, linguists had something that was valuable to the public. Um, and actually the production of the OED is an interesting case because that did involve the public. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on. But really this is about linguists um, packaging their knowledge, if you like, um, for the public um, in such a way as to make it uh, accessible um, and useful to them. 
Um, and of course, that sort of thing uh, goes on a, a lot nowadays. Kate was talking about uh, talking on the radio and, and, and on the TV. Um, it, it involves things like publishing popular books on language, um, like Jane Setter's really entertaining book that, that came out uh, a couple of years ago, I think, where she talked about um, the, the importance of uh, the sound system of language and phonetics and really tried to explain that in a, in a really accessible way. And it's really what I've tried to do with my colleagues when we developed Babel, which is a, a magazine that tries to make linguistics accessible to the public. So that is what I would call contributory public engagement. Um, there is also, um, I think, the more transactional public engagement. So I think we're often used to thinking about communicating linguistics as talking to the, the general public. But sometimes what you're doing is responding to a very specific request, and that might come from a, a private company, for example. Um, I did a, a, some work a, a few years ago with uh, colleagues for the House of Lords uh, in the UK, looking at ways of implementing a subtitling system um, for parliamentary debates. So that was really about taking academic knowledge again and making it accessible, but this time in response to a very specific commission. Uh, and I was thinking particularly here about um, the rise in forensic linguistics and forensic speech science um, over the last few decades. And there are now various labs um, throughout the world that specialise in this kind of thing. But even then, you can go quite far back in the history of linguistics and see this kind of thing happening. Um, think about Chomsky's early work, which was funded by the US military, for example. Um, so there has always been that sort of transactional element to linguistics. I think, interestingly, because it straddles the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, and although there is a very theoretical end to linguistics, it does also have these very practical applications. Um, and then finally, there is what we call reciprocal um, public engagement. Um, and interestingly, the, the uh, National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement in the UK um, defines reciprocity as, as a, a sort of uh, a necessary element of public engagement. And I, I think it's a really important one. I would perhaps argue about the degree to which you have to have reciprocity involved in public engagement, because I think that can vary. But I was thinking here particularly about um, Natalie Braber's uh, really interesting work that she's done over the last few years. Um, Natalie is Professor of Linguistics at Nottingham Trent University and has done a lot of work on trying to preserve uh, the language of the mining communities of the East Midlands. And that's resulted in lots of things like public exhibitions um, and uh, in, in addition to, to public talks. Um, and the point about that work that she did was it wouldn't exist without the communities that she was working with. They were the ones who provided the, uh, the data, if you like, um, and really shaped those exhibitions that Natalie and, and her colleagues put together. Um, so we get something from that as linguists and the public gets something back. Um, so those were a few various different kinds of public engagement that, that uh, Hazel and I talked about in the, uh, the introduction to, to our book on communicating linguistics. And um, as I said, one of the reasons we put that book together was because it struck us that there were so many different kinds of public engagement projects out there that it was worth trying to collect uh, those together. Because I think it's really important to, to know that um, public lectures and, and radio broadcasting and, and TV broadcasting, important as they are, um, they're not the only way of doing public linguistics. And if that's something that you'd like to do, but you're finding it hard to sort of break into uh, radio or TV or whatever it might be. There are lots of other ways of going about it too. So we've got chapters in that book um, on podcasting uh, and on putting exhibitions together, um, on, on dialect coaching. Um, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Um, and that book is open access. So if you are thinking about doing uh, some public engagement and you want some ideas about how to go about it, um, we asked our contributors to write uh, chapters that were as practical as they could possibly make them. So I think there's lots of really interesting uh, advice in there. And I have to say, it's one of the most fun projects that, that I've worked on. Um, and lastly, I'll just say a little bit um, about the magazine that, that I founded uh, with my colleague, Leslie Jeffries, about 11 years ago now. Um, and that really came out of us 
noticing that you could go in a, in a news agent and you could buy magazines about art or about history or about science, but there was nothing, uh, there was no equivalent for, for language. And it struck us that there was a bit of a gap in the market there. Um, so we put together um, a, a magazine that we thought would, would address that. And one of the founding principles was that all our articles would be written by academic linguists about their own research. So although there are lots of very good journalists out there writing about language, we wanted um, people to be hearing about language from the horse's mouth, if you like, from the, the linguists themselves. And uh, we set that magazine up when we were both at the University of Huddersfield. Um, Leslie retired last year and I moved to Sweden. And at that point, what we managed to do was extract the magazine with some difficulty um, from Huddersfield. And we set it up um, as uh, an independent company in its own right. So it is now a bit closer to what we originally envisaged in that it is, I hope, a resource for the linguistics community uh, uh, as a whole. It isn't something that is a public engagement project that would help with our student recruitment, for example. It's not tied to any particular uh, university. So, it, so it's out there in the world as a representative of, of linguistics. And if you would like to write for Babel, you would be very welcome. Um, and quite often, um, it's, it's quite a nice exercise to take an academic article that, that you've written and produce a popular version of it. We have lots of different kinds of articles in the magazine. I've been writing a, a series recently that, that tries to make the history of English um, interesting and fun and enjoyable to, uh, to, to a younger uh, readership. So um, uh, if you're interested in that, Google Babel, the language magazine, feel free to send me um, a, an email and we, we can talk about uh, how you might contribute to that. Um, so I should also stop there, I think, um, and that, that's the end of my, uh, uh, my advertisement for the, the magazine. Um, but I hope that that has addressed some of those questions, Bernd. And, uh, and maybe now we can we can talk more generally about them. Absolutely, yes. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks a lot, Kate. Um, and um, as I said, I mean, I, I will have a look at the watch. And if there are immediate questions now already, then feel free to um, ask a question. Otherwise, you may have assumed already that I have also some questions lined up. But this would be the first opportunity to come in, to ask questions or to share experiences, best practices that uh, that you tried out or that you observed and that you would like to share with all of us. And I think you will have noticed already, I, I mean, of course, at the center of the public engagement of, uh, of Kate and Dan stands, especially the English language. I'm not sure with Babel. Babel, you have more languages also that's, 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 that's relevant, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, we've always been very keen to make sure that it is a magazine about linguistics. I think inevitably, because it's written in English, uh, we do end up publishing an awful lot about the English language. But we are very keen to, to commission articles about other languages. And we do have a regular series that um, is just a couple of pages where we take a different world language uh, every issue and just give a sort of quick five minute explanation of what that language is how it's produced, where it came from, you know, what's its current status, is it endangered, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very keen to, to cover as, as many languages as possible. Yeah. And I was only mentioning this because, I mean, um, first of all, we have people in the audience uh, who primarily do not work on English, but work also on other languages. But then the other thing is, regardless whether we work on English or not, I think what's what's important for us as linguists is often the national context. Um, so which is which is the national or local context in which we work? And very often if I if I um, operate from Germany or from Sweden, um, I may not the public may not be that interested in hearing something about the English language. Typically it's then you know English takes over everything. Uh, why should we have um, English medium instruction at universities and things like that? But very often it's rather things that are of interest, let's say in, in my case for the for the German uh, population, you know, gendering, you know, so so the gender sensitive language use, things like that or, um, some 20 years ago, I think it was the orthography reform in, in, in Germany, which uh, I, I think has really 
done damage to the public image of linguists for decades uh, because people more or less blamed these specialists for the fact that they now have to to relearn uh, German orthography. Okay, so all right, uh, but here we have a 